Hi, what's happening? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores, and today I want to update y'all on everything that's happened within the past four days since I put out my most recent video. Rivera getting fined, Carson Wentz throwing no look passes and practices. Like, how far ahead is he in getting comfortable with the offense if he's out here throwing no look passes? Also, a Jay Gruden comment on OTA, some of the players that we released, some of the players that we signed. Also, FedEx Field will host an Army Navy game. DC will not be getting a FIFA World Cup game though. And more, then we'll dive into all of the crazy statistics, facts, and opinions that I have seen over the past couple of weeks. People have ranked the top O lines in the NFL going into this season, the top D lines, NFL team net worths, most playoff wins since the Super Bowl era, all kinds of just random crazy stats and opinions. Somebody ranked the top 2022 quarterbacks, and Carson Wentz, I mean, I don't necessarily think he's going to be the best quarterback doing it, but where they have him ranked is crazy. But before we dive into all of that, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell next to the subscription button so you get a notification immediately. And every time I release an informative and opinionated video, just like this one, I was pretty busy over the weekend. So now I'm about to start hitting you up with content. Like I said, for the channel members, y'all are going to get the film sessions. I'm working on a while. The Washington Commander should have a top five, at the very least, top 10 O line this year, providing a lot of advanced statistics. Same thing with Terry McLaurin. I'm doing a why we should pay Terry McLaurin video. I'm going to bring up all of the advanced stats and crazy things he's had to do with. Not just his stats but the stats of quarterbacks that's been thrown to him and receivers opposite of him all of that type of stuff so i'm gonna do a whole tribute to terry McLaurin and why we need to pay him exactly what he wants and all of that and a lot more content on the way on top of all of that and without further ado let's get it All right, so first of all, I caught a clip a couple of days ago of Carson Wentz throwing a no-look pass. And I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Granted, I don't necessarily want him doing that in games. But the main thing I take from this is that he's comfortable. A guy that's on edge and worried about learning the playbook and stressing over the fact that he's not performing too well and he's not where he wants to be. Or I mean, even being ahead of schedule, which we're going to also talk about very soon. But the fact that he's comfortable enough to throw no-look passes, again, it's practice. But I mean, if he were like really behind on learning the playbook, Book, he'd probably be locked in on doing that so the fact that he's out there just having fun and just trying stuff shows that like the mental part and learning the offense is of course he doesn't have it 100 down but he's far enough to where he's comfortable to do that and also i mean the commanders themselves and scott turner specifically are comfortable with carson wentz's progress in learning the offense in the playbook because logan paulson pointed this out that they were already running two minute drills and situational things in otas normally quarterbacks that are just now joining the team say like you just drafted a rookie or you just signed over a veteran unless they already have previous experience in that exact offense from that coordinator or that head coach or whatever usually you don't get in the situational football like two minute offense red zone drills all that type of stuff until they know the playbook which usually isn't until training camp for most cases so the fact that we're already in OTAs and we're doing all kinds of stuff throwing everything we can at Carson Wentz we're like okay you got the basics of the playbook let's go ahead and work on some more advanced stuff that does have me optimistic about how well he'll perform this year it's not saying that he's gonna go out there and ball out but if anything at the very least that's good news to hear also jay gruden was on a podcast or a radio show somewhere and he said that you can basically tell in otas early on if a guy is special especially at a skill position he also said that you can tell if a guy isn't ready for the league in otas as well and i can kind of see where he's coming from i can't really see it for anything but skill position skill positions maybe i can kind of see what he's saying i see the logic i mean granted jay gruden was the one that knew that terry mclaurin was going to be like basically terry mclaurin he sat him in the preseason and we were like why are you sitting your rookie in the preseason we need to give him as many routes as many catches as many targets as he can get and then terry mclaurin ended up balling out and basically jay gruden is saying that you basically know you have a terry mclaurin on your hands 
by OTAs. And the reason I bring this up is because do we potentially have somebody like that in Jahan Dotson? It does benefit the team to hype up pretty much every player we bring in here, especially like media and then the coaches themselves like Rivera and the guys. But like this Jahan Dotson hype is very similar to the Terry McLaurin hype. But you got to remember though, Terry McLaurin was a third round pick. Jahan Dotson was a first round pick. And I'm not saying that to say that Jahan Dotson will be better than Terry McLaurin, but he does come in here with expectations. Whereas Terry McLaurin, when we drafted him, we thought he was going to be a gunner. We brought him in to be a gunner. Once he started making plays on offense, we were like, okay, we'll see where this goes. But we didn't know for sure. We didn't have these expectations of him becoming a wide receiver one or anything like that. And so Jahan Dotson kind of has similar expectations to that. If we didn't have Terry McLaurin drafting Jahan Dotson in the first round, like we did, we would expect him to come in here and be the best receiver. But luckily the fact that we have Terry McLaurin, he can come here and be the second best receiver at best, honestly off rip. And we'll see where he goes throughout his career. But again, the hype around him is very similar to what we had in Terry McLaurin. And we'll see if that actually shows up on the field so far has been showing up in practices. No corner we have on this roster can even kind of keep up with them except for Benjamin St. Juice at this point. Moving on, the Washington Commanders wave defensive back Will Adams and kicker Brian Johnson. I'm going to take that as Joey Sly looks fully healthy and he's good to go. We shouldn't have to worry about his injury. Remember, his, he got hurt last year due to a freak accident. Basically, his kick got blocked and then he tried to run down the field and, and try to make a tackle. And it's just like not even worth it. Like he should never try that again. So I don't think Joey Sly is injury prone. I think that was just a freak accident situation. Crazy circumstance. So I guess they feel confident in his ability to I mean, I already know talent wise and kicking wise I'm, I'm really comfortable with having them as our franchise kicker but health wise apparently the commanders are like okay we've seen enough we can go ahead and release brian johnson and brian johnson is a good replacement kicker i mean we had two kickers last year and joey sly and brian johnson that were better than what we ever got in dustin hopkins in my opinion brian johnson was kicking and so that's a great backup plan to have if nobody ever picks him up and you also got to remember we signed joey sly to a contract this offseason so i, I mean that just looks like writing on the wall once joey sly was healthy enough it seemed like it was inevitable for us to move on from brian johnson and then we also signed defensive tackle justin hamilton who's had experience on the cowboys d line so they're trying to get some depth there again we're trying to replace tim Settle and matt with fedarian mathis and i mean maybe potentially justin hamilton on the inside we'll see and we also signed offensive tackle willie bevers and again i want to reiterate matt and tim Settle were fifth round picks fedarian mathis was a second round pick so at the very least he better come in and be as good as them if not better now we'll see if he can ever potentially replace deron Payne, who it looks like we do not plan on paying long term and keeping long term but as far as tim settle and matt knight is fedarian mathis better be better than them and so far it sounds like in off-season practices otas and mandatory mini camps it sounds like he's out there doing that sounds like he's out there having a really good off-season so far looking like he's worthy of that second round pick also again like i already said in the intro fedex field will host the army navy game in 2024 also the washington commanders announced their 2022 nun wooden scouting fellows it will be kenyatta watson and zarek rollins established in 2015 the nun wooden scouting fellowship exposes interested and qualified candidates to a career in professional scouting the program gives participants a unique glimpse into player personnel by introducing them to various areas related to college and pro scouting within a club so we're giving kenyatta watson and zarek rollins an honest chance and i love this I love this initiative to try to diversify the NFL in any way, whether it be scouting, GMs, head coaches. I would love to get some owners in there. Also, Taylor Heineke said a funny thing. He was on a radio show. They asked him if he can challenge Carson Wentz for the QB1 job. And he was very straightforward. He said, quote, if you're paying someone $30 million and you're paying someone else $2 million, you're paying this guy $30 million to play, you know? Carson's a great QB. My job is just to back him up, unquote. So it sounds like we already have the tiers of established Carson Wentz is the starter Taylor Heineke is the backup Sam Howell is the developmental quarterback and Cole Kelly's just the guy to go out there and throw practice ending interceptions like Steven Montez I mean of course we all knew that but it's nice to know that Taylor Heineke already know where he fits in the pecking order of the QB room and then lastly before we move on to all of these crazy stats as many of y'all know the commanders coach Ron Rivera was fined 100,000 and Washington loses two 2023 OTA practices due to excessive contact and practice drills 
and i just found this really weird because first of all like ron rivera has preached on and on and on to not have any excessive contact and practices so why would the team be punished if this was based on like a couple of plays from players and then also my point is like what did the nfl send rivera and company like in the memo like we're finding you we're taking these two practices how do they measure how much contact do they say you had x amount of collisions you had this many players injured or you had this many practices where players were doing too much what number how do you quantify this how do you measure excessive contact to the point that you can present it with concrete evidence and find us and take away practices for it because it sounds really subjective it just sounds like i mean i guess somebody from the nfl pa was looking it was like oh that hit looked like it hurt let's go ahead and find them and i guess maybe we had enough of those but i mean again i just don't know how you measure this and present it on paper like you had this many hits you had this much excessive contact with a number to even rationalize finding us and taking away these practices but it's kind of funny after we find jack del rio ron rivera gets fined shortly afterwards i don't know if jack del rio was out here snitching on the low <laughs> i don't know what's going on but i just think that whole situation is crazy it's not much to really dive into we're gonna miss those practices next year i'm sure but it just seems like one of those things is done is done i'm not even sure if we can appeal it i mean is this from the jeremy reeves hit on deami brown or are there other cases and again i mean going back to the fact that I mean, if it's just a couple of outlier plays why are they not like targeting the players if anything rather than the entire team and honestly i feel like they should have a meeting with the players of that team ask them do y'all feel like there was excessive contact because at the end of the day the nfl pa's job is to really look over the players and i feel like honestly they should just sit down before they actually go through with finding us and taking away the practices sit down with the players on the washington commanders and ask them do y'all feel like this was excessive because if so then we'll go ahead and go through with this fine if not cool if y'all cool with it we cool with it but i don't know man i guess it's just one of those things they have certain rules it's in writing and they gotta abide by it i don't know but again i still don't know how you measure this that's my number one problem with this how do you quantify too much contact what number do you place on that is it like rated on a scale and then let's go ahead and get to all of the fun statistics first of all let's start with the nfl team net worths according to the most recent forbes report in the washington commanders of fifth worth 4.2 billion dollars the nfc east has three teams in the top five in all four within the top 10 so that just lets you know who's the most important nfl conference I mean, it'd be nice if a lot of us was winning, but hey, we'll figure it out eventually. Hopefully, we're one of those teams that starts to win consistently and form a dynasty. We'll see. And then at the same time, being the fifth most valuable NFL franchise, when you look at the 2021 average home attendance, we were by far the lowest with a 64.3%. That is crazy. Teams are out here with 100%. We were out there with 64.3%, and the Broncos didn't even go to the playoffs and they had 100%. The Seahawks were pretty bad. Bad. even when russell wilson came back they had 99 percent. i mean the lions had almost 20 percent more than we did like we are like way last like it's not even close there's a steep drop off after the lions to us also most rushing first downs plus touchdowns in 2021 yet antonio gibson in second place with 65 but this just shows how dominant of a season jonathan allen had with 106 nobody even close to him granted derrick henry was hurt for a lot of the season so maybe he would be ahead of antonio gibson nick chubb also missed a few games maybe he'd be above antonio gibson but as of right now who knows not gonna do hypotheticals antonio gibson was second also cbs wanted to show the most playoff wins in super bowl air in the super bowl air and we're tied for 11th in a three-way tie with the dolphins and giants with 20 playoff wins now just imagine if we didn't only have one playoff win in the last 20 plus years under dan snyder where we'd be ranked I mean, the fact that we're still tied for 11 with 20 and we've only won one in the past 20 plus years, that is crazy. We need to start fix that. We need to go ahead and fix that before it's too late. We don't want to continue losing and being sorry for the next 20, 30 years again. And then now we're like ranked 25th or something. And now we're getting the QB rankings and there's two different rankings. There's one from around the NFL, which we're going to start with. 
they have their consensus QB rankings. They also have like tiers, as you can see on the screen. But they have Carson Wentz 23rd with Teddy Bridgewater, Daniel Jones. I mean, even Tua, who we haven't even seen much of yet. And I, st I mean, I still don't get the Jimmy Garoppolo situation. I don't even get why Jimmy Garoppolo is over Baker Mayfield. But yeah, man, they just out here hating on Carson Wentz. But this next one is even worse. They hate it even worse on this one. So the game day NFL came out with their list. Of course, with the top 10, as you can see on the screen, Aaron Rodgers all the way down to Russell Wilson. I didn't expect Carson Wentz to be on there at all. Even though, if we're talking about talent, Carson Wentz has top 10 talent. Is he going to be able to put it all together and actually play like a top 10 quarterback? So, I mean, at the very least, we have a guy that has it in him, at least a little bit. I can't stand going out there with an average quarterback, and then we're just hoping to build a great team around him. Even though I prefer to draft a quarterback, I'm at least happy with the fact that Carson Wentz has a high ceiling. I can't stand a low ceiling quarterback. Nothing irritates me more than a low ceiling quarterback, and now we're just perpetually average for the next 10 plus years. And then Carson Wentz, as you can see on the screen, is not in the top 20. And Trevor Lawrence is already 18. Justin Fields already 19. Mac Jones already 20. Okay, interesting. Then you have Trey Lance. Love Trey Lance, but I mean, 21, he hasn't even done anything yet. I guess these are projections. Uh, Jalen Hurts, y'all already know I'm not a big Jalen Hurts fan. Jimmy Garoppolo, like I said, I, I mean, that's just crazy. We'll see with Zach Wilson. We still got to see a little bit more with Davis Mills. Definitely got to see with Tua. Mitchell Trubisky, I mean, over, bro, they hate it. Carson Wentz 30th, man. Carson, under some of these names, is just blasphemy there's a few names currently on the screen that is just like no way y'all think Carson Wentz is going to be worse than these guys going forward there's just no way if you're basing this off of what everybody did last season Carson Wentz should be higher than a lot of these names and then going forward with the offense we got around him I think he's I think a lot of these lists are going to look crazy by the end of the season as long as he doesn't get hurt I think Carson Wentz is going to have a meteoric rise I'm not saying he's going to be top 10 not even necessarily top 15 but 30th is crazy and then of course the back end 31 through 35 Kenny Pickett Daniel Jones Marcus Mariota Teddy Bridgewater and Sam Darnold that sounds like it makes quite a bit of sense then also pro football focus came out with their 2022 defensive line and offensive line rankings for defensive line there's only six teams in the elite category and we're second out of the entire list the only team in front of us is the Rams but if Aaron Donald would not have returned this season then we would have been number one easily and the Rams probably even fall out of the top six so I mean hey shout out to Aaron Donald I understand why they have the Rams against us but that's definitely notable that we would literally be the number one defensive line in the NFL according to pro football focus if it weren't for Aaron Donald getting that big contract extension to stay with the Rams and again without Aaron Donald the Rams aren't even in the top six so that's pretty cool man at least pro football focus knows if these guys can work together for Darian Mathis with his unselfish play that's the one thing about Matt Ioannidis and a couple of those guys last year everybody was being selfish everybody was going out there for stats it's nice to have a guy like Fedarian Mathis is going to eat up double teams and allow other guys to make plays. So that's going to be really good. I think our defensive line should just play better naturally. First of all, guys healthier. Chase Young motivated to bounce back. Montez Sweat, the same thing. I think naturally our defensive line should be one of the best three in the NFL. I definitely agree with that. Now, offensive line wise, they have us in the second tier. Tier one is minor or no weaknesses. Tier two is a high floor. And then tier three is high end potential. And we're third in that list, which puts us 15th overall. There, our projected starting lineup, of course, is left tackle Charles Leno, left guard Andrew Norwell, center Chase Roulier whenever he gets back healthy, right guard Trey Turner, and right tackle Samuel Cosme. They said the commanders couldn't have asked for a better one year free agent signing than Charles Leno at left tackle last season. He earned an 87.3 pass blocking grade after getting cut by the Bears in the offseason. If Samuel Cosme can build upon his 74.9 overall grade as a rookie, Washington will have a solid tackle duo. They didn't address the interior offensive line which is easily the biggest question mark with us replacing Eric Flowers and Brandon Sheriff with Andrew Norwell and Trey Turner but the fact that they still have us as a top 15 offensive line is respectable but again I'm working on a video as to why we should have a top five at the very least top 10 offensive line but I can kind of understand with the way they're doing their tiers they're not ranking necessarily the best they're going with like I said tier one is minor or no weaknesses solid all the way across which makes sense I mean to me I feel like the offensive line with no weaknesses is a better offensive a line than the one that has a couple of weaknesses and a couple of pro bowlers on it so i do agree with that but then they have the high floor tier right after that and then we're in the high-end potential one 
so i mean they're giving us a ranking based on our potential and if they can go out there and perform and they can show that our floor is actually higher than they think then our offensive line would be ranked higher than this also pignum came out showing the biggest blowouts of the last 10 years and it's not an order of blowout it's in chronological order and so we're not the worst one on here but it is kind of funny when you look at the top and see 56 to 14 last year against the cowboys when we had no team i mean it was third stringers everywhere so i mean of course i don't care that i don't care that game was a super fluke anyway but i mean at the very least we're not some of these teams out here with zero i mean you have 45 to 0 38 to 0 52 to 0 and 58 to 0 man that that sucks and then pro football impact and the wenzel perspective came out with each nfl's team offensive goat like just all throughout history and they have first of all eli manning for the giants which is who but they have trent williams for us are the best offensive player we've ever had in our franchise franchise's history and i think that's an interesting argument man that's definitely the main thing i want to hear about in the comments which brings me to the point that this is the end of the video please get in the comment section let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video again like i just said please let me know how you feel about this being our offensive goat because i think honestly some people are going to be angry about this with just how the whole trent williams situation went down but i think this is a compelling argument i may not actually agree but i think this definitely has some merit to it where some people may be a little too emotional to admit that trent williams even kind of makes sense and i am a little offended that my boy cam i love steve smith but you know not to have my boy cam for the panthers i'm offended but y'all already know i don't play about cam but again man yeah definitely get in the comment section let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video the first half with all of the news i presented and then the second half with all of the crazy statistics opinions rankings all of that type of stuff man definitely let me know and of course man i appreciate all of the support man shouts out to all of my sponsors especially my pro bowl sponsors name you see scrolling on the screen right now man i really appreciate y'all catch y'all later i'm out <laughs>